just amazed. This is my story, don't skip a page. And this is what I live to say. My whole life was a giveaway, uh. I'm not afraid of the giants inside. I'm not afraid of the scars. Pressure on diamond is good for the shining. I should not be here recording the science and naming a number, checking some money. Tell me, why do you want me when all I have is these damaged goods? If I could fly, homie, man, I would. Foster kid was what I'm branded with, uh. And I did not ask for this. Fear, depression, and abandonment. Tell me, how do I handle it? Because when things got hard, I survived. I climbed. I waited for you. You died. I cried. Uh. How could they take me away? How could you love me if you gave me away? Everyone I let in just leaves. Please hold on to me. Who do you want me to be? Because my family needs more than a casualty of circumstance. And I am bigger than my circumstance. Start tripping or learn to dance. Take my hand. You're worth the chance. A chance to inspire. I am a fire. Come catch a spark. Put out your hand and you might catch a heart. It's all that it takes. Fall into place. Copy and paste. Recreate these homes. We create because home is a place where you ease the pain. Meet your strength and keep your faith. Rally around us, we'll do it together Leave what's behind and then move to the better We all need a sense of home And meeting you gave me a sense of hope That's 27-year-old Mike Jelks An aspiring musician from Los Angeles Telling his story about growing up as a foster child And working for a nonprofit called A Sense of Home This episode is the first of two Focusing on the U.S. foster care system In honor of May being National Foster Care Month Today we'll look at one end of the spectrum Youth who age out of the system at 18 or 21 and the challenges they face. Next episode, we'll look at the other end, young children five and under who find themselves in foster care. On any given day, there are more than 400,000 children in the U.S. foster care system. So it's a critical component of the safety net we've put in place to ensure the well-being of children. Yet, as anyone in the foster care system will tell you, it's far from perfect, and the challenges that foster kids face often affect them for a lifetime. We hope these next two episodes help shine a light on the foster care system, how it works and sometimes doesn't work, and two organizations doing what they can to help. This is Crazy Good Turns. We tell stories about people who do amazing things for others, and I'm your host, Brad Shaw. I grew up in foster care my entire life. So since the moment I came out of my mother's womb that I was placed into foster care, and uh I live with a family, with a, a lady who was supposed to be the mother, my mother for, my legal guardian for like the rest of my life. She ended up dying when I was eight. She was a Caucasian lady, so it was, I was growing up in a world that was foreign to me. She and her family loved me as if I was their own, but I could still feel the disconnect in culture and just, you know, my skin tone. I grew up, I grew up not liking my skin color because of everything that I seen around me. And then I, after she passed away, I moved around to a couple different families. I started traveling for the first time, which was moving to different homes. And then I got to live with my first African-American family. I was like, finally, I get to to fit in a little bit because I get to be around people who look like me. And then I was kind of chastised for not speaking the same way as my my peers did in the moment or because I dressed differently, I I I still couldn't fit in. And then after that, I moved around to a couple more homes. That's Mike Jokes again. And despite the difficulties he faced as a foster child, he says it actually wasn't that bad compared to what other foster kids faced. A lot of the homes that I grew up in, they were uh, they were good homes. I mean, there was one home where I experienced some abuse at uh, physical abuse. But other than that, I had a pretty, you know, G rated story compared to some of my other peers that I I began to uh, to befriend growing up in foster care system. They had crazy horror stories. And I was I was very grateful for the things I didn't have to go through. Yolanda Elam from Long Beach, California, also spent much of her youth in the foster system. My experience in the foster system, like most people, not not good. I had been placed in the foster care system because uh, my mom had passed away. Well, she actually had took her life when I was seven months old and then um, leaving me with my dad and his new wife. Um, At the age 14, I got taken out of my home for extreme physical abuse and emotional abuse and neglect. And that's when I had my first experience getting taken out of the home and into the actual system. From that point on, I was placed in about three different placements. And then from there, off to college. Yolanda says her desire to attend college wasn't really about getting an education. What actually motivated me to go to college wasn't 
actually getting an education, but having somewhere to live for the next four years because I just wanted to be in one stable place. So I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll apply to college and I'll get into the dorms. <laughs> but my plan kind of backfired on me because I didn't stay in the dorms too long because of financial aid situations. And so I actually ended up living in maybe 12 different locations throughout college, couch surfing, and times that I didn't have anywhere to live, I would stay in my car. So I had this kind of, you know, crazy experience in college. Every two minutes, a child in America enters the foster system. A large majority never find a permanent family. They get placed in short-term homes or transitional facilities and have an average of seven homes before the age of 18. What a lot of people don't know is this. As hard as life can be for kids in the foster care system, it doesn't instantly get better when they turn 18 or 21 and stop needing a legal guardian, what people in the field call aging out. When young adults age out of the foster care system, if everything works according to plan, they're placed in a transitional facility. Think of it like a halfway house of sorts. There, they receive support from social workers for things like getting into a community college, maybe learning some technical skills so they can get a job, and ensuring they have important life skills to live independently. People who work with kids aging out of the foster care system try their best to ensure they feel safe being on their own, that they can trust others despite the trauma and abuse that often marks their past. That's until they find more permanent housing, often a Section 8 apartment or a small studio. The problem is that many aged out foster youth are barely making ends meet and can't afford even the basic furnishings, a dresser, a bed, a table to dine at. They often store their clothes in bags, eat and sleep on the floor, and stare at bare walls. After bouncing around from house to house their whole life, they might now have a house they can call their own, but they don't have a home. So when you've never felt like you belong in a home um, or you belong to a family, that you don't belong in the world. And then without that sense of home, that sense of belonging, you don't have the foundation from which you can thrive. So the statistics on foster youth are such that he wouldn't make it, that incarceration, homelessness, unemployment, undereducated, the statistics on foster youth are that they're the most likely to fail in America. So it becomes pretty clear when you're out on your own and you can't create that foundation to thrive. It's no wonder that the odds are stacked against them. That's Georgie Smith, the founder and executive director of Los Angeles-based nonprofit A Sense of Home. Born and raised in Perth, Australia, Georgie attended the prestigious Australian film, television, and radio school and had a successful career as a writer, producer, and director in Australia before moving to L.A. in 2001 to practice her craft there. She had a side interior design and catering business and would sometimes post videos of her home makeovers and events on Facebook. Georgie had no prior interaction with the foster care system, but that all changed one day in 2014 with one Facebook post. It was actually a video of me uh, designing someone's space and then creating a celebration there that led to a video being posted on Facebook to a young man seeing that video on Facebook and asking me for help. I had no idea what he was asking me for, but I went to go down to see his situation, which he asked me to see, which was his first ever apartment, which was a Section 8 apartment um, in Long Beach. And he asked me to to come and see it. He didn't really quite know what he was asking for help for, but I responded to seeing him just living amongst his black garbage bags and not having a refrigerator or anything to eat his food off of or any kind of way of living other than being on the floor that I asked all my friends to donate hand-me-downs as they would for their own, thinking about their own child setting off to create their first home for the first time. I had such an enormous response within the first 24 hours that I had everything that he needed and then I requested that <laughs> I then made another post on Facebook, who wants to come and help me collect all of these amazing donated items and who's got trucks? And so one Saturday we sort of had this convoy of friends with pickup trucks and vans that went around uh, collecting all these donated items and then together with this young man, Barry, we went to his home, uh, his apartment and then turned it into a home with all of the donated items. We had absolutely everything he needed. The young man Georgie and her friends helped was Barry Bartlett a recently aged out foster youth who had moved from a transitional facility to his own Section 8 apartment. Then he was out on his own, so without any community there to support him with any kind of hand-me-downs, it would have been at, at least $10,000 from Ikea to just furnish everything without appliances. So it was sort of very clear to me that without, you know, having any family to go to, 
There's without family, there's no community. Therefore, there's no hand-me-downs. How can one set up a life on their own? And we all have too much stuff. So I thought, well, let's just share that stuff with those that really need it. And then let's share the time that we have to truly make a difference in someone's life. Barry didn't know how to use the pots and pans that were donated to him, so Georgie took him to a nearby farmer's market, bought him fresh food, and taught him how to meal prep for the week and how to cater a dinner for his friends. The two decided to throw a thank you party for all who had helped. We invited his friends from the transitional facility over and everyone that had donated and had volunteered to create a housewarming for him. And it was a wonderful celebration. There was lots of music and singing and dancing and wonderful speeches. It was a real uh, full circle for him. And all of his friends that came said, excuse me, miss, is this a service? And I assumed um, that such a thing would exist in the world. And I said, look, I, I'm not a service, but I'm going to get you connected with someone that does this. There must be an organisation that is doing this. You'd think there'd be such an organisation given the central role of housing during this fragile transition period. Each year, more than 25,000 foster kids age out of the system. About 50% of aged out youth experience homelessness. 20% suffer from PTSD from their traumatic youth. Many get caught in what's called the foster care to prison pipeline. For young adults like Barry, it can be hard to stand firmly on their feet in their new adult reality without a place to be comfortable to become themselves. And I searched and searched and searched and there was no one, to my surprise, doing it anywhere. I thought if I could find someone doing it somewhere in America, I could convince them to do it in LA, but there was no one. So I then went to all of the experts that I knew in the foster care space and said, look, I just did this um, home for this young man. The transformation was remarkable. I'm looking at the evidence and I see scientifically that this does have a huge impact on an individual. And I showed them my research. I showed them a video that my partner, Melissa, had shot of the experience and tried to convince others to do it. And they said, you know, we've, all, you know, we've got our hands full, so you do it. And all these girls were about to be sleeping on the floor and or already were sleeping on the floor. And I just, well, I couldn't just stop at one. So I continued to post on Facebook and then ask friends to meet me. We, you know, started renting U-Hauls on a Sunday and who would meet me at locations where there was donations to be picked up. And then we would go around and pick up like about eight collections of donations, like from 6 a.m. to about 12. And then we would start heading off to these empty apartments and then filling them. We would often do four in a day. It wasn't long before Georgie filed for nonprofit status and quit her various day jobs to run a sense of home full time. And it's been nonstop ever since. I haven't had a, you know, a day off. I mean, I've gone back to Australia, but I, you know, working nonstop on my laptop every minute of the day. It's it's consumed my life. It's there's such a need. And the thing is is not only is it there a need, but there's this massive enthusiasm from the general public to participate. There it's it's like me thinking like, "Oh, duh, there will be a service that does this." When people see this, they're like, "Duh, we should be doing this." So there is a enormous need to replicate around the country and in fact the western world. And there is a, a very strong desire for people to participate. We have a, a problem of too many volunteers. So we've been not only madly working to keep up with the demand of the youth in need, but we've been trying to create the structure and the system so that we can facilitate the enormous amount of enthusiasm for people to participate in this experience. Georgie and her team have furnished and decorated nearly 200 homes for former foster youth in the greater LA area. Participating youth are required to have a GED, studying toward one or working at least 30 hours a week. Their furnishing and decor items are stored in a donated warehouse in Carson just outside of LA and are transported to the homes in two donated trucks. When it comes to the home creation, which is always on a weekend or a Friday, and we prep the day before. So we will prep and we'll pull the items and we'll stage it and then wrap it and load it into the truck. And then we go to a home location. So the the youth has received a Section 8 voucher. They have their apartment, they have their keys, and then we turn up the day that they've ready to move in or a few days after and all the volunteers meet us there. We unload the truck and create the home together. The home creation itself is a celebration, complete with music, singing, great food, and storytelling. Georgie says they actually have more volunteers signed up than they can deploy in any given week. And what you do see is just automatically everyone checks any ego at the door or any issues at the door and they just come in with heart. So their heart shines and you see how effective when you work together 
what you can achieve in one hour. And then, of course, they get educated. They get educated in terms of foster youth. There is even an, you know, an ability to understand racism further because they get to op- they get to walk in someone's shoes as best as one can walk in someone's shoes. They get that opportunity to walk into someone's shoes in a very intimate environment of their home to truly understand their experience. They get to understand their city better, their community better. They get to understand that their society, their community is their responsibility and that they can have a hand in shaping and improving that city and society and community. Uh, So they feel empowered. They feel ready to create change. They feel ready to build healthier communities, to build bridges between disparate communities. They can't wait to get out of their bubble more. So we're going to be creating a, a home for a sense of home where everyone can come together and experience wonderful experiences beyond a home creation together. A couple of years ago, Yolanda Elam had her apartment decorated by a sense of home. After graduating from college, she landed a job as a child care counselor and got a small studio apartment, but couldn't afford to furnish it. She saw her friend Barry's Instagram post about his home creation, which was Georgie's very first. She messaged Barry. I said, hey, like, who are those people? (laughs) Like, I need those people. Do you think they'll come and help me? And he was like, yeah. And he got us email connected. I connected with Georgie, and then they ended up coming to my little studio apartment, like, a couple weeks later. And so can you describe your apartment before and then after and sort of what it did for you as a person in your life in terms of what the sense of home did to to your apartment? You know, I didn't have much. And just prior to them coming to my home, I had been in this situation where I was sleeping in my car a lot. So I, I had bags of clothes. You know, I was just so grateful to actually have a little apartment. So when I found out about them, I couldn't believe that they were going to come and bring me all these items. They ended up coming with maybe like 15 people, and I was kind of shocked because I didn't think they all were going to fit in my studio apartment. And they immediately just started doing the bed (laughs) in the kitchen, uh, putting together like a little sofa. And I was just kind of standing there like, what am I supposed to do? In that moment, I realized, you know, I was so grateful, but I had realized that really it was the people that came in and were kind of putting everything together that really meant the most to me, opposed to the actual furniture items. So when they had left, all I could think about was these people that just gave up their time to help me and and brought me all these amazing things. And the furniture was like an added touch to it. So that's actually what intrigued me more to, um, to stay involved. That she did. She was so blown away by the experience that she emailed Georgie and offered to stay involved with her efforts. And Georgie offered her a job as a Sense of Home's very first employee. She's been there ever since and is now program director. And I talk about this sometimes on how just I was so scared of the stigma attached to foster youth and being part of the foster care system that made me feel that I you know, wasn't valued or worthy until I started getting involved with a sense of home. That made me look at the system differently and then it also made me look at myself differently. In fact, Yolanda is one of now seven full-time employees at a sense of home who are former foster care children, including Mike Jelks, who now wears several hats at the organization, including warehouse supervisor, peer mediator, motivational speaker, and musician at the home creation events. It's challenged me to uh, be a leader. It's challenged me to be actually a voice. I'm, I'm a very quiet kind of person and I kind of fade to the back whenever chance I can. But a sense of home and just the, uh, the opportunities that's been presented has really helped me to just own my power, I guess you can say, uh, my, and my potential. Because growing up, I didn't really have a lot of people to tell me that I had a potential or that I could be a leader, I can be something. And the opportunities and experiences that I had with a sense of home have always been to push me into that that space of being a leader and being someone who, who has a voice and can actually help people out. So I feel like the best thing a sense of home's done for me is challenge me in, in, a, in many good ways to be a better person and, and someone who can uh, speak for my generation. Hiring former foster care children isn't just symbolism for Georgie. She sees it as a critical part of their effort to raise awareness about the foster care system and erase some of the stigmas and myths associated with it and adoption. What's great about A Sense of Home is that you get to look at these amazing individuals and you're like, oh my God, I would have loved to have adopted. Look at look how well they turned out having it overcome all of that abuse, fended for themselves and look at what they're doing. I, I could have raised that child. So it, it shows, we show what the kids become um, which might become an inspiration for people to 
adopt. And then once we have enough people wanting to adopt, then let's make it easier for them to adopt. Um, I think that what we're able to do is that we have a happy version of the story, which is a hopeful and positive future for these youth. And they're creating this movement. They're creating this organization. They're leading this organization. They're running it day to day. Um, look at them as leaders of the change that they seek. People can watch what we're doing and be inspired by it because it's hopeful and it's wonderful and positive. And then through that experience, they can sort of then start to look at what is foster youth. Um, and most people, most well-educated people just don't know about the system. And then, of course, they then don't know about ageing out. So I think that it's many things that we need to do, which is education. So we need to tell good stories about foster youth. I learned a lot working on this episode. A lot about the foster care system, a lot about foster kids and the lives they lead through to adulthood. And I learned how important a sense of home truly is, probably because I've taken it for granted my whole life. More as something that's defined where I live, not necessarily who I am. There's a whole line of um, psychology called environmental psychology, which has proven that, that we see ourselves the way we see our environment. So if someone's sleeping and eating off of the floor, then they think that's all they deserve. But then if you create an inspired, exquisite apartment that you would be happy living in, then they feel that they're as worthy as you, Brad, that they are able to be something in this world. That The impact is on many layers, and it's, it's, that's the odd thing, is it's so simple and so obvious that we share what we have too much of, that we share our time, that we create these homes for people without family. It's so obvious, but the impact is profound and it's long lasting. So what's the one thing you'd ask our listeners to do to make the world a better place? To get involved, to participate in where you see that there's a problem in your community, know that you can work towards a solution, gather with like-minded people within your community, put it out there because you actually might even not realize how like-minded everyone is and work on a solution together. And community is for us to work on together. We can lift it up. We don't need to walk past a problem. We can find a solution for it. I'm Brad Shaw, and thanks for listening to this episode of Crazy Good Turns. Go to crazygoodturns.org to learn more about or donate to A Sense of Home and to submit your ideas for extraordinary people and organizations we should feature. And stay connected with us between episodes by following us on Facebook and Twitter. If you like the music we selected for this episode, you can go to our website to stream a Spotify playlist of the full tracks. And if you're a band with a song we should consider featuring, you can submit it on our website too. We should point out that three of this week's songs are by Lauren Elam, Mike Jelks, and R. Anthony Lee, all former foster youth. This season, we're excited to announce that we're giving a $50,000 grant to the nonprofit that does the most to creatively spread their Crazy Good Turn story a virtuous and self-reinforcing circle of gratitude. We'll announce the grant recipient at the end of this season. Crazy Good Turns is audio engineered by Stephen Key. Music supervision and mixing by Score Score in Los Angeles. And a special thanks to Megan Basinger. Take care and let's connect again soon. We walk in and places, these homes, these studios, or these apartments, they usually don't have anything. There's a lot of bags, there's a lot of old furniture, uh, things that, you know, people, you can tell the youth they don't really, they don't really take too much pride in. And what we come to do, and I think Georgie said, and it's super key, is we we want, we let them know that they're worthy of these things. We let them know that they're worthy of this love and this, uh, this community that we're trying to build around them. Let's go. Is that cool? <laughs> okay.